So Dr. Hale is here and uh, she is a nephrologist with the nephrology specialist here in Tulsa and she completed her medical degree at Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine is board certified in nephrology. We always wish that she would be an oncologist, but we lost her to the kidney. Dr. Hale is a, a specializes in glomerular disease, and we really look forward to her presentation. She's always exciting and pleasing to be around. hear me now? We good? Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be focusing on nephrology pearls or kind of the management of CKD pearls. So when I was making this presentation, I had a few goals in mind and kind of what sparked my inspiration and just kind of made it flow was I really chose things that I got asked the most questions about from all specialties, all types of providers. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. You know, we're talking about nephrology pearls. I'm going to talk about all of the most commonly asked questions. So my hopes when you leave here today, a lot of those commonly asked questions get answered and leaving way more confident in treating CKD patients. Um, we already talked about my credentials, but I just want to add, I love the kidneys. I'm very passionate about what I do, very passionate about transplant patients and glomerular patients. So you'll hear me talking a lot about that today. Um, so goals and objectives, we're going to be talking about what are the nuances in the diagnosis of CKD. Um, there's a lot more to it than you would expect. Um, when would you refer to me or anybody? <laughs> um, protein management, um, especially with some of these newer line medicines. We're going to be talking about what do you do with hematuria. Um, anemia of chronic kidney disease, we'll touch on a little. We'll talk about the importance of metabolic acidosis management, blood pressure goals and considerations from a nephrologist standpoint. Uh, medications that you should take caution with and maybe even avoid will also kind of slide right into contrast induced nephropathy. And then lastly, talk about how do we maximize a patient's potential for transplant. So everyone has seen this a million and one times. This is almost everywhere. But one of the things I get most asked about was, okay, I get it. CKD three through five easy. Patients have that GFR for three or more months. I'll slap that diagnosis on them. I get that. But who is CKD stage one? Am I CKD stage one? No, you don't have CKD stage one. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on when I talk about the nuances of diagnosis of CKD. Um, that's where I find people get the most tripped up on. And also where patients, there's this kind of like limbo stage where something is happening, but if we're not paying close attention, those red flags, those warning signs go unnoticed and they progress rapidly. Um, so like I talked about, we often know, hey, if somebody's had a sustained GFR less than 60 for greater than three months, hey, that qualifies for CKD. We also know diabetic kidney disease, in and out. Hey, if they have micro or macroalbuminuria, easy, they have CKD. So these are the other little nuances that often go unnoted, and I'll even kind of touch a little bit on them as well. So like I said, we all know albuminuria inside and out. Um, hematuria is often where people kind of are like, what do I do about this? And we'll talk about that even today as well, like I said. Um, if somebody has, you know, any GFR and they have RBC casts, any type of cast, fat oval body, something is happening. There's something brewing underneath the surface. Um, if they have any renal anatomic abnormalities, um, so renal artery stenosis, you can have a normal GFR and be CKD stage one with just that. Polycystic kidney disease, that's a pretty common one. Um, this one right here, especially I get asked about in particular. So I have... Um, referrals and their question is purely that. I have a patient with a cyst or a mass. The imaging is pretty consistent with it being malignant. It's, it has a lot of the characteristics. The radiologist is making it very clear. They need to go to urologist. Something needs to be cut out. Do I send them to you first? Do I send them to a urologist first? Do I send them to you both? The answer is send it to us both. We work in coordination with one another. Um, before this reason right here, you cut out a part or completely take out a kidney, they're chronic kidney disease patient. They should be monitored by a nephrologist. 
There's also instances where I'm looking through and I'm making sure we're not missing anything because I've actually had uh, instances where we think that the hematuria is secondary to uh, just that mass. But when you kind of look at things on a deeper level, I'm like, their proteinuria is not consistent with that. Something about this doesn't really add up. Um, I've had two cases in which um, there was a, both were adult white males who they had, the mass was actually an incidental finding because they presented with palpable purpura and also hematuria. And I was like, that's not the kidney mass, that's Hinoxlokin. And so we sent uh, part of the healthy tissue along with the mass to pathology. Sure enough, they had a, a IJ vasculitis. So it's, all, it's not a bad idea. I would recommend send it to us both because they're gonna have to be followed by us both from here on out. So that's also a good instance right there. Um, other in, uh, cases, glomerular diseases, of course. Um, and then lastly, if they're a transplant patient, just because they got the kidney transplant, they're still a CKD one or two patient with a normal GFR creatinine because, hey, they're not functioning with just every single nephron they're borrowing someone else's. <laughs> so why does that matter? I've already kind of touched on it. A lot of times it means that something else is brewing. And so in kind of being aware of those nuances helps um, you guys be able to pick up something because primary cares, other specialties, you're gonna see the patient long before I do. I don't know that they exist unless you tell me. Um, and so catching those little nuances, referring to them um, when you're kind of worried or questioning something, we can prevent these patients from progressing rapidly. The biggest one right here is glomerular diseases. You can see a change in the GFR about 15.5% about annually. Granted, I think that's a little exaggerated because it takes, it only takes like FSGS and HUS and it says every other glomerular disease. But I still think there's some truth to that, that if you're not catching something early, another example would be lupus nephritis. Um, we don't wait for their creatinine to get worse. We treat based on the classification of the lupus nephritis based on their biopsy. And so if somebody has lupus and, and we don't realize that they have a concomitant lupus nephritis and we're not doing everything to manage that, that can go missed, that can uh, progress and scar before and before we can do something and it's too late. So you have a patient, you have a question, they have or a known chronic kidney disease, um, when should you refer? My first and foremost honest answer is, if you think that you need me, you're 100% right. Um, I have yet to have any instant where somebody was like, something's weird here and they weren't right and there was something brewing. So if you think that you need me, you don't have to wait for a certain GFR send them uh, my way, we'll work something up. There's probably something brewing. Um, but sadly, sometimes this doesn't always happen. Um, and so this was a study that I found that kind of showed that I don't think that we do a very good education on making sure like, okay, when should we refer to a nephrologist? I feel like it's too much of a gray area. And there's a couple of things that I found that supported this that made me go, okay, we do need to talk about this. So this was a study that was conducted by NKF, um, and they looked at how well are IM residents being prepared in managing and referring CKD patients. They looked at 479 IM residents um, across the US, and they had an equal amount of PGY1, twos, and threes. And they were assessed via a questionnaire um, just about CKD in general. And the results were not so good. They're a little abysmal. Um, the first one being that really shocked me. I was like, that, that has to be better than that. 50% did not know the presence of kidney damage for three or more months to find CKD. And that was, it didn't matter if they were PGI1s, twos, or threes, that was equal across the board. Um, they knew, 99% knew the traditional risk factors for CKD, but some things like obesity was very lacking. And I have to say, if there's actually something that's starting to become equivalent to diabetes and high blood pressure for being a cause for um, chronic kidney disease, obesity is a big one, especially with worsening proteinuria. Um, the same thing with elderly age, that was you know, not too bad, and then African-American race. Um, one third of residents didn't even know the GFR stages and 90% of residents chose that the time to refer a nephrologist was when their GFR was less than 30%. So I was like, I went on up to date because I was like, okay, that's what residents often use. Is that maybe like, what is it saying over on there? 
And I was like, shame, shame. <laughs> so the, this is literally the first paragraph and it says patients with CKD should be referred to a nephrologist when the estimated GFR is less than 30, which like blew my mind because if you go and look at the proteinuria sections, all up on top is like those little boxes that are like, click on this, there's this medicine, like you can do this new medicine for proteinuria, there's this new diabetic med, there's this new landmark trial. All of those medicines, and we'll talk about that, you have to intervene on that when the GFR is above 30. They have not been tested yet in a GFR less than 30. So how am I gonna intervene? How are you gonna intervene if we're not really paying attention until, oops, GFR is less than 30, right? So I was like, come on up to date. We gotta update that article. <laughs> and so there's a lot of data that shows, hey, patients who are referred earlier, they do better because we're working together. Um, to make sure this patient doesn't progress faster than they need to. Um, one of the first, I mean, when I first see a patient in my clinic, I spend about an hour with them. Um, I'm going through every little nuance about what do we need to avoid? The damage that's done is done. We gotta avoid any other damage being done. And this is the way we're gonna do it. I talk about blood pressure, diabetes, weight loss. I talk about all of these new medicines that we may or may not consider. Um, I really give them a thorough education. I, like I said, I care. I love what I, I love what I do. I'm very passionate about it. You as physicians in, in your, in the family medicine clinic or internal medicine clinic, you are dealing with so much. You do not have the hour to spend going into that depth. I can, I'm more than willing to. And just to give you an idea, that's one of the reasons when you refer them earlier, they do better. They're getting that early education. You have somebody else on your side, on your team, that's focusing on that one little thing so that you can take care of the rest. Let us, let us take care of the kidneys. We love them. Um, so multiple studies showed that late referrals and lack of prior CKD management led to increased morbidity and mortality. Um, patients who were referred late had a high risk of deaths within 90 days. Um, this one really breaks my heart because, and I see it all the time, um, this is very much an independent risk factor for patients not being put on the transplant list or getting a transplant. Um, once again, lack of consistent care six months prior to um, increases the risk of mortality. Um, taking that one step further, we know that um, managing proteinuria improves outcomes. Proteinuria is its own independent risk factor for um, chronic vascular outcomes, which is the number one thing that kills our patients. Um, so regardless of the type of diabetes or amount of proteinuria, we have an increased risk of mortality from the renal failure, cardiovascular disease, or other cause of death. There was the PREVENT study that looked at 40,000 patients and found that Proteinuria had a 30% increase in CV mortality. HOPE trial found worse outcomes than those with proteinuria independent of traditional CV risk factors. So very, very, very important to get the ball rolling. Um, this here kind of shows similar things, but just shows you the rate of decline. So it starts when you're about here. Um, and this kind of broke it into weird, this not like the real GFR stages, but around three, a going into 3B, you see things sharply go up and sharply worsen. Also same with albuminuria, you kind of get to a point and things kind of rapidly decline. But mainly it's this right here where things really kind of rapid, they don't have a lot of time and their, their uh, increased risk of mortality significantly increases. So one thing that I always talk about is at the end of the day, my goal with my patients is preventing them from progressing. But if despite our best efforts, they do, I want to refer them for a transplant. The treatment of choice is transplant, not dialysis. Um, and so that's my biggest thing. That's kind of my big platform. <laughs> um, so all of that being said, when would I recommend referring? I would say at least 3B, if not even 3A. And like we were talking about before, if you have somebody who is GFR stage one or two and you're noticing persistent hematuria or a renal mass, do you think that there's a question that needs to be answered? Send them my way, you are right. If there's something that you feel like is fishy, you are right. Um, but all of this, you need time to intervene and prevent, especially with these new medications that are uh, available, which we will talk about. Um, and if I can't keep them away from ESRD, 
during that time, I have enough time to develop a relationship with them, help them to lose weight, um, get any other type of comorbidities in, in line with you and see what we can do to get them transplanted. Um, and if I can't get them a transplant, I want time to talk to them about and get them ready for peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis. Um, the reason being people who do peritoneal dialysis, when you look at the data, it says that they only live one month longer, if I remember correctly. I think that, that there's a lot of things to take into that. I don't really believe that. I think that patients who do PD, if anything, at the end of the day, they have a way better quality of life. They're staying at home. They're able to, they don't have to restrict their diet as much. Their blood pressure is more controlled, less uh, depression and suicide because nobody likes to feel like their life and independence has been taken away from them. PD gives them a little bit of that back. They're doing it at home. They feel like they, hey, I'm taking care of me. I'm taking charge. Um, my first choice, once again, it delay progression, see about transplant. If I can't do those things, let's do peritoneal dialysis first if you're a candidate. So we've talked about all that. What are we gonna do to delay progression? What are we gonna do to prevent Progression, Ugh, I keep saying that. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk first about proteinuria and order of management. So um, this is something that is new and up and coming. Um, this isn't something that you would have looked at before. I mean, we all know ACEs and ARBs, but here in the past, like what, less than 10 years, we have a lot more and it's so exciting. <laughs> um, I remember as a senior resident, talking about all these meds and be like, look out, they're coming. And I'm just, I'm so excited to be here today and be like, yes, they're FDA approved. We use these medicines. We have more than just an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool and I'm gonna talk about too is um, we also have more pot uh, potassium binding resins now that have less side effects that work more effectively. And even so much to the point that the KDGO guidelines that were published, the update is in 2020, our last update was in 2012. That's kind of like what we use to go as nephrologists. Um, now include those as part of the regimen. They, instead of stopping an ACE or an ARB or even decreasing it, they would recommend considering starting somebody on like Proteramir or uh, Lokoma um, instead of stopping the medicines altogether, because we know so much that if we're controlling proteinuria as much as we can, we're preventing all of these bad outcomes. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about here for a little bit. So with SGL2 inhibitors, um, first thing we'll talk about is the Credence trial. So in this one specifically, they're talking about diabetic kidney disease. Um, and that's very important to know. Um, these patients were already on an ACE or an ARB and their GFRs, like I was kind of touching on before, they're studying them in those with the GFR greater than 30. And what they found was that there was a 30% reduction in the primary outcome of a composite and stage kidney disease, um, progressing to a GFR less than 15, needing dialysis, needing transplant, doubling of the creatinine or death from renal or cardiovascular causes. And they found that they were able to lower these things by 34%, um, the relative risk, sorry. Um, so when you look at that at first glance, it doesn't make sense why you would use that for proteinuria because you're like, you said nothing about proteinuria. You just talked about decreased mortality and decreased rate of progression. So where are we using this for proteinuria? The idea behind that comes from looking at three other trials um, that were smaller and then also a meta-analysis of the Credence trial. And what they found was that these benefits were the most pronounced with those with severe albuminuria, greater than 300 milligrams a day. And when you think about why this would work, it works similar to ACE inhibitors and ARBs. They're decreasing the intraglomerular pressure, therefore decreasing proteinuria. So they kind of took that line of thinking and they're like, this isn't because of treating diabetes. That's not why we're getting improved proteinuria. It's working similarly. It's decreasing intraglomerular pressure. Let's look at it in those with uh, CKD with and without diabetes and see if we're still getting the same thing. So here, once again, most were on ACEs and ARBs. They looked at 20, a GFR of 25 to 75, and they found similar results. You delayed um, the incidence of ESRD, 
you decrease mortality, you reduce the risk of a 50% or greater decline in GFR, and the benefits were similar in both groups, reinforcing the idea that it had nothing to do with glycemic control, they're de that these are actually improving proteinuria and renal disease in itself. Um, before I actually move on, I love this medicine. I use it a lot. If we share any patients, you probably see everyone almost on Farsiga. Um, and as a glomerular specialist, the one group of people that I've fallen in love with this medicine for is IgA. Um, so IgA nephropathy, we've changed our way of treating those in the past few years. There was a stop IgAN trial that came out that said, hey, stop throwing steroids at them. Patients who get treated um, for their proteinuria and maximizing that um, do just as better, if not better than those that do and get bursts of steroids. If they're not improving, then you can toss some steroids on board. Um, I've had a couple patients already who had about three grams of protein in the urine. And a lot of times these IgA patients, they don't have any other issues. So I have them on like 2.5 of lisinopril. It's doing not very much. I can't increase it anymore because then they'll be hypotensive. I've had one of my patients on Parsiga for less than three months and her proteinuria has gone from about five to seven grams when we first started, three to five grams with just the ACE, and, uh, ACE inhibitor on to now less than 500 milligrams. So I love this medicine, it works. Um, and her renal function is actually starting to improve now too. So she is very happy and so am I. So um, something that we don't really talk about and often gets missed for proteinuria management is uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. Um, so it, when you kind of look and think about the pathophysiology, it makes sense. Um, I don't know why it's not something we've incorporated more. I think a lot of it's we, we fear worsening hyperkalemia and that's, that's very fair. But essentially you are inhibiting this cascade of inflammatory markers that are delaying fibrosis, you're delaying high, uh, hypertrophy, sclerosis, you're decreasing proteinuria because you're doing something similar once again, you're decreasing intraglomerular pressure and you're reducing, um, you're preventing that reduction in renal blood flow. So um, the Fidelio trial looked at finerone specifically. Um, this medicine is been studied against other MRAs like aldactone, and it's found that it has less rates of hyperkalemia, um, improves proteinuria better than your other MRAs. Um, and when it was matched against um, or when it, when it studied just to look at um, how would it improve proteinuria and renal outcomes, it did fairly well. So there was about a 31% greater reduction. Um, I won't keep on going through everything. I think you're starting to believe me that, hey, it's good for the kidneys. <laughs> um, but the big thing too was, yes, there were more hyperkalemia outcomes. However, no fatal hyperkalemia results were reported. So why don't we use finerone more then? Um, I found this article and I think the very first sentence kind of really sums it up. It was good, but not good enough. And it came out along where other landmark trials were like the Credence and the DAPA CKD. And it kind of just lost its luster because of that. It got outshined by, those, by the SGL2 inhibitors. Um, if you look here, kind of that's what this chart is showing here. And this last sentence kind of sums it up. Um, and compared to placebo, yeah, it, for example, reduced risk by 10%, but these other ones did 17 and 30%. They just outcompeted it. The other thing is when it first came out and I haven't really put any patients on it to know if this is still true, it was rather expensive and difficult to get. And then who are these patients that were most likely going to start these on? It's diabetics. Um, were worried in itself enough to have them max out on an ACE and ARB. They're mildly hyperkalemic. There's just not really a niche for it. We don't want to add now an MRA and drive it up even further. Um, I think in the future, this may be something that comes around. I don't know if it, if it goes generic, if it's something that people are like, absolutely start tossing it on. And now we have these better potassium binding resins and it will be more popular. But once again, we just know aldactone so well, and it's so cheap too. That's another reason why we're like, hey, aldactone can kind of does the same thing. Just toss it on if you really want something. So I think it just kind of came out in the wrong time. <laughs> um, lastly, GLP-1 agonists. Um, 
make a long story short, that's kind of like the, as we keep going down the totem pole of treatment, they also too showed that um, they don't necessarily reduce proteinuria, but they reduce the new onset of macroalbuminuria. And both of these studies um, showed just that, that uh, patients who already had albuminuria, nothing really changed, but for diabetics that didn't, it prevented the new onset of it, which is big because we know just that right there, that's a big risk factor for ending up on dialysis. And so, like I said, last thing I'll say about proteinuria, before you think about stopping an ACE or an ARB, see if you want to try a potassium binding resin if you have them on a good dose, you're able to manage their proteinuria, but they keep having some mild hyperkalemia. With these medicines, you don't even need to take them every single day. I have some patients that take it maybe twice a week. Um, they can take it even just like every Sunday. I even have dialysis patients that just do that, but they're also getting dialysis. Um, and it still does a good, that plus a low potassium diet does fairly well. They don't necessarily even need to take it every single day um, and definitely not three times a day. Um, so going into now hematuria, how am I doing on time by the way? Okay. Awesome. All right. So how you even know if there's something going on, you want at least two repeats of a UA showing um, about three to five RBCs per high power field, which is not a lot at all. Um, that's kind of also something my reason I think that it often gets missed. You're like, ah, eh, five RBCs, nothing to write home about, right? But there could be something brewing. The initial workup, like I said, you want at least two UAs. And you want to rule out, obviously, an infectious source or another etiology that could explain it. So if they have a UTI, you got to repeat it some other time. If they have an indwelling catheter, easy peasy, goes without saying. The other thing, you want to get a renal ultrasound um, before I'm doing anything. I'm not sending anyone for a biopsy unless they have a renal ultrasound and make sure they don't have the stone, a mass, or some other anatomical explanation for this. Um, Lastly, if all of the above is negative and you really can't explain it and it is persistent, that's when I start going, okay, maybe something else is going on here because persistent hematuria can turn into something rather uh, unwelcoming. So initially what I typically get is I'm gonna look at complements and that can kind of be for various of things. A lot of times that goes with lupus. Um, you can consider an ANCA and anti-GBM if this is uh, rapidly progressing. Um, hepatitis, HIV, and you can even consider getting serum immunofixation and free light chains. Um, the most common cause, if we're talking about a glomerular disease, is going to be IgA nephropathy. Um, and like I was talking about, if there's all of these are negative and the patient's kind of holding steady, unless something abruptly changes, I won't necessarily biopsy them because as we know now with IgA nephropathy, our goal is more proteinuria management than anything else. The other thing that's kind of worth noting is um, I, one of the things I kind of, especially in teaching a lot when I'm on rounds is about RPGNs. I'm very passionate about that. Why? I don't know. I just am. Um, <laughs> but I always refer and teach them about this right here. Whoops. Yeah, I pressed the wrong button. There we go. Um, with ANCA and anti-GBM and sometimes with other immune complex uh, GNs, they're not going to be um, indolent processes. They're going to appear abruptly. Um, so an ANCA has a sensitivity and specificity of about 72.5%, 98.4%. And uh, basically the positive predictive value increases for a picture that really says, hey, this is in your face, something is happening right now and the negative predictive value, you can confidently say, hey, even though you have hematuria present, if I'm negative and none of these things are going on, like, yeah, rest easy. Don't be sniffing up any, you know, don't need to be barking up this tree. Um, the reason I also kind of talk about it so much is I do get a lot of patients that are self-pay. I really have to sit through and kind of divvy up what am I gonna do for them? What is really the risk versus benefits versus the cost? Um, I once called regional medical lab and I asked them, hey, tell me the prices of all these labs. They're not cheap. Um, so that's kind of why I weigh what I do. 
So make a long story short with hematuria, really the first steps is rule out an anatomical process. If the hematuria is at or an infection, if it is persistent, even if the creatinine is normal, it may be so worth sending them my way to get a, a GN workup and make sure there's not something malignant brewing. Um, anemia of chronic kidney disease, we'll touch on this just a little. Um, so this is not foolproof. And I don't know if Dr. Calabrese would necessarily agree, but when I was going through fellowship, some of the readings would often kind of say, hey, if nothing else is going on without EPO replacement, a patient's hemoglobin should not be low eight. We all have seen cases of that, that well, that's not necessarily true. So this is not foolproof in any means, but I do kind of still keep it in the back of my mind. Um, if I see a patient present with a hemoglobin less than eight and they are a CKD patient or an ESRD patient, I do stop myself and ask, hey, are you up to date with your colonoscopies? If it's an ESRD patient, I'm stopping myself and I'm going, okay, what's their PTH? Do they have an infected foot? Is there something else going on? So that's kind of the moral of the story. Um, not saying that, oh, it's never because they're not getting enough EPO or that they need to be started on EPO, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind if you are encountering that. There probably could be a, a mass or a GI bleed going on. Um, so when we're taking care of patients with anemia of chronic kidney disease, our two kind of, uh, our goal is to keep a hemoglobin between 10 and 11. We have multiple studies that show if you try to push it above that, especially with epigen, you're increasing the risk of strokes, thrombosis, bad outcomes. Um, and we like to treat iron deficiency first because like we said, you overdo it with the EPO, bad things are gonna happen. Um, the other thing is we're often using IV iron and the reason being is goes, in, goes back to the pathophysiology of it all. So yes, we have decreased EPO, we need to replace that, but hepcidian is the biggest culprit in uh, anemia of chronic kidney disease when it comes to the iron deficiency. It's preventing the uptake in the duodenum. So a lot of times these patients, they not, it, oral iron, it's just not gonna cut it. It's not getting absorbed. So what we do, once again, we're wanting to decrease side effects from EPO, minimize blood transfusions because I want them to be a candidate for transplant later on and I don't want them to get overly sensitized. Um, typically consider them for IV iron if their SATs are less than 30 or a ferritin's less than 500 and that can vary based on their degree of chronic kidney disease or if they're on dialysis. And um, we may even consider it for a ferritin greater than 1500 um, if they're CKD stage five late four um, and there's not like an infection present. Um, but the other thing that's also kind of comforting to know in this, um, treating these patients do not increase the risk of infections. We have a couple of trials, I think mainly the DRIVE trial that showed that. So let's talk a little bit about metabolic acidosis and CKD. Um, metabolic acidosis in patients with CKD, it often goes kind of unnoted. Um, but we don't really, when we stop and think about it, really a lot of bad outcomes from this as well too. First and foremost, it just makes the patients feel crummy. Um, you can, and you probably have seen that a lot in these patients with chronic kidney disease, especially stage four or kind of stage five, not on dialysis. They just feel like half a human. And a lot of times acidosis can be contributing to that. Um, it causes a lot of bone mineral disease. It can cause muscle weakness. Um, if it's happening in children, it can stunt their growth. Um, it causes impaired myocardial activity, heart failure, resistance to growth hormone and insulin, hypertriglyceridemia. It can actually make it difficult for them to lose weight, believe it or not. Um, it contributes to their inflammation, causes hypotension, malaise, and the biggest thing, increased risk of mortality and progression of their kidney disease. Um, there's multiple observational studies that show that a bicarb less than 22 increases the risk of mortality, which a bicarb of 22 is like nothing. Um, and the same thing, that less than 22 is increasing the risk of progressing much more rapidly. Um, one thing, one study that I found that was really interesting, and this, I didn't know this um, until I, I read about it, was they did a trial, this like, um, I'm sorry, those buttons are right next to each other. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, this trial right here, greater than uh, 5,000 patients were looked at and they all had a GFR, um, sorry, that's greater than 60. 
And it showed that for every standard deviation under the typical bicarb level, you increase the risk of uh, rapid decline and CKD by 12%, which I thought was interesting. So even in patients without CKD, metabolic acidosis isn't good and you're increasing the risk of chronic kidney disease. So easy to treat. Um, we start them on bicarbonate tablets or sodium citrate, um, citrate as we know, gets converted into bicarbonate in the liver. Something that I'm also educate patients on and there's growing evidence on is um, incorporating more plant-based um, proteins or just a vegan vegetarian diet also can delay the progression of renal disease. And that's because you're introducing alkali foods into their diet. So as we know, um, we sometimes get scared to tell these patients, oh, eat animal meats. Um, we, want you, we don't want you to get acid, more acidotic, but then they're not getting the nutrition, their proteinuria. I tell, I, I tell them to go and get plant-based uh, protein shakes. And that not only is that helping your nutrition, but actually maybe uh, slowing your progression of renal disease and improving alkalis. So I think it's pretty cool. I talk about that was one of the things I educate my patients on. I don't tell them necessarily to go vegan or vegetarian, but to incorporate it. Um, so now we're gonna talk, we're gonna spend a little bit here on blood pressure management. Am I still doing okay on time? Okay, good. So first and foremost, this is from a nephrologist standpoint. These are not, nephro the reason I say that is because these, as we know, are all big cardiology um, studies. I know that there, there can be a little bit like different opinions based on the treatment of blood pressure. I mean, if there's one thing that gives me whiplash, it's what should we treat? What goal blood pressure should we treat a patient? Because when I started medical school and I hope I'm not like making myself sound too much of a baby, but when I started medical school, um, I was being taught JNC seven. And then by the time I was doing my rounds, it was JNC eight. And then residency, it was ACC, HA, whatever guidelines. And I was like, what do you want me to do? I don't know, low or high blood pressure, I don't know. So I hope is to help make that less confusing today. But even more importantly, I, if you know why, it makes sense. And every single patient is different. We all know that one blood pressure for one person is gonna make them dizzy and hypotensive, especially if they're used to being in the systolic of 220s being in a systolic blood pressure 120s is gonna be harder and gonna make them feel a lot crudier than somebody who you first meet for the first time that had a systolic in the 150s and now you're trying to get them to a systolic of 120s. Um, so I'm gonna throw that little caveat in there because I know we all have, there can be a lot of different opinions um, since it's ever so changing. But I like this timeline because um, here on the bottom, it shows the different guidelines that have been published. And then it shows up here, what were the um, trials that kind of swayed the opinion. So here the ACCORD trial, um, when, and we're talking about here kind of JNC8, they were saying, hey, let's be less strict. Let's do a systolic blood pressure in the 140s. Um, they looked, they based this off of the ACCORD trial and this one looked specifically at diabetic patients. And they found that if you're comparing them to systolic of 120s to a systolic of 140s, you're not changing mortality outcomes or cardiovascular outcomes. Um, but there was kind of a little bit of a caveat on that. With that, they were also strictly um, managing their, uh, their blood sugars and then also their hyperlipidemia. So there's even like a secondary analyses of this where they're like, if you take away that, there actually is a benefit with higher strict blood pressure control. And we'll talk about that. And then you have this trial here, the SPS3, and that looked at, hey, if I compare a systolic blood pressure of 130 to a systolic blood pressure 150, am I going to decrease the risk of stroke? The answer was no, unless it's hemorrhagic. So that's kind of where JNC came into play. Um, and they're saying, hey, let's, let's base it on age. Let's be less strict. Let's base it on chronic disease and diabetes. Well, then the SPRINT trial came out and it kind of changed our minds again and said, hey, maybe we should be more strict than we thought that we sh that than what we were doing. So um, this was a pretty big trial. It started off with over 14,000 patients. It then kind of went over to a little over 9,000 and they were divided into those that were going to aim for systolic 120s versus a systolic of 140s. 
throughout the trial, on average, the intensive group was on about 2.8 blood pressure medicines, while the standard was on 1.8. Um, I, I included this algorithm because it was important to me because I'm going to talk a bit about the management as well. Um, it, during the trial, they chose medicines that we commonly use today, which is a thiazide, an ACE or an ARB, or a calcium channel blocker as at least your initial blood pressure medicine. So when they were doing this, they weren't doing anything funky. They weren't doing anything out of the ordinary. They were trying to keep with what we already knew and say, hey, and I should have also said, these are in non-diabetic patients. If we try to be strict with them, are we improving our outcomes? Um, during the trial, a lot, about 76 um, patients were on an A short R, while only about 55% uh, were not, and that's important. We'll talk about that later. And then much less diuretics in the non-intensive uh, group versus 67% in the intensive group. So um, the results vary on the initial publication versus the 2021 update. As far as the initial publication, um, it did outstanding, so much so that they even uh, stopped the trial early. Um, and what they found was there's a 25% lower risk of the primary outcome, um, that being decreasing fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events or death, decreased heart failure, um, death of any cause, and this was consistent through all of the subgroups. Um, the big thing from my standpoint too, for those with CKD at baseline, there was no difference in the GFR um, or reaching ESRD. However, in those who did not already have CKD, you did have higher incidences of AKI, um, and that being a decrease in the GFR of 30% um, or to a value less than uh, 60. Hypotension was also more common, but this did not result in more falls. So where I'm going with all of this is in the 2021 update, um, the big thing from my kind of standpoint, yeah, there were decreased, um, they didn't find that decrease in heart rate rates. I'm, my kind of theory as a nephrologist as well, you're in, you have an increased use of diuretics up front. That's probably why cardiologists probably have more information on that. I'm focusing it on a nephrologist standpoint, <laughs> but still no difference in the G, decrease in GFR or reaching ESRD in those who had CKD. But the big thing here, and I think this is really important, is with AKIs, this still occurred early. However, it resolved by one year, and after 18 months, the difference between the two groups stabilized. I think this is really important and teaches a big lesson, and it's one that I get consulted on, whether it's outpatient or inpatient on all the time. You have somebody who presents with a systolic in the 200s. They're a little bit edematous. You get started started on multiple medications, you start a diuretic, rightly so. Um, I get consulted a couple of days later saying, I stopped the diuretics, what have I done? I messed up, no you didn't. This is a hemodynamic change. It will reacclimate. If they're making urine, you've done right by them. You needed to control their blood pressure. You got them on the right things finally. So this, kind of, this is the new changes with the guidelines. They took out pre-hypertension. Um, they're, they kind of took out also the age differentiations and they're really just focusing what's on their blood pressure, what's their AS, uh, CVD, and make a determination of treatment based on that. This is just an algorithm that shows that a little bit more pretty. Um, and then um, we'll go into the all hat trial that explains, hey, why do we choose a diuretic calcium channel blocker and ACE and ARB? Make a long story short, because I think I am running low on time. I have, okay. When you compare a diuretic to an ACE or a calcium channel blocker, as far as your cardiovascular outcomes, you're doing about similarly, you're lowering the blood pressure similarly. However, you have increased risk of heart failure or even an increased risk of stroke with lisinopril. Um, and so doxazosin was even just taken out of the mix altogether because it increases the risk of heart failure from the get-go. Um, but overall, chlorthalidone fared better in just all categories. And that's why we do what we do. Um, I learned this from my program director. This is something that I talk about with the residents all the time. Just a little reminder, switch back and forth between the classes. That's how you'll get the best response as well too. And I kind of, if you kind of take a step back, I always kind of look at it. Am I working on the RAS or am I just kind of working on vasodilators and volume? I got to switch back and forth. So overall plan of action, 
Ask yourself, do they have other comorbidities? Do they have macroalbuminuria? Yes, that's gonna take into account for what blood pressure you're gonna choose. Um, you still have to take into account race, even though we kind of removed that from our most current guidelines because we just know from others series that African-Americans do better on a diuretic and they do better with ARBs because they're less likely to have angioedema. So I'm almost done. Last couple of things we're gonna talk about. What questions? Okay, I know. I knew it was gonna go over because I just had so much to talk about. <laughs> um, I bet I can give me like two more minutes and I'll speed, speed through it and we can do questions. Does that work? Okay. Cautionary meds. We all know a lot about this. I won't spend too much time on this because there's other things I'd rather talk about. But my main thing with this was NSAIDs. They cause a lot of different insults of injuries. I always keep that in mind when I see them for the first time I'm looking at NSAID induced uh, kidney disease. I think this is way more important to talk about when we're talking about cautionary things. Contrast induced nephropathy, I get asked about this more than anything else probably. Um, I'm not here to argue whether or not it's real. It is real, I see it all the time. I just don't think it's what people think is, is or what's really going on. Uh, mainly just being that we're using normal saline to volume expand, reduce vasoconstriction and reduce medullary hypoxia. That's the main thing that we're doing to prevent and that's really the pathophysiology. It's not anything that we're necessarily like washing out, it's mainly to volume expand them. So, when I'm seeing a patient with contrast-induced nephropathy, um, I kind of refer to the Poseidon trial and I kind of do, I steal kind of my information from that. Um, essentially what the Poseidon trial found was that when you adjusted the rate of fluids, um, instead of just doing a standard rate of fluids one hour before and four hours after, that's another thing, you don't have to do it for 24 hours. You can do it just kind of before and after the procedure. Um, patients did a lot better. And the whole moral of the story is adjust the rate of fluids based on their volume status. That really is all there is to it. I do it an hour before, I do it four hours after. And if their volume deplete, I'm being more aggressive. If there's somebody who is in heart failure and they are got pulmonary edema and they're already hypertensive, I may even withhold it up, uh, altogether and just hold their diuretics that day. Um, so lastly, uh, maximizing a patient's potential for transplant. Um, so it goes without saying, if you get yourself a kidney, you're gonna live longer, you're gonna do better. Um, the big things that um, I work on with patients when I first start to see them and I work on with um, my physicians that refer to me is maximizing their potential, mainly with these things right here. Um, when we start noticing, hey, you're going down that line, we start working on, hey, are you up to date on your cancer screenings? Um, if you have heart failure, EF of 40%, let's get you into a cardiologist. Let's get you on those great medicines and Tresto. What do we got to do to get your EF improved? Um, biggest one, and this I feel like is the biggest reasons patients don't get transplanted today, is they have a BMI greater than 30 um, and so I start working with the primary care doctor and being like, how do we get them to lose weight? Do we need to do um, Ozempic? Do we need to refer to a dietitian, nutritionist, something, anything so that we optimize our chance? Talk, talk about tobacco and alcohol cessation because they got to be free of it for at least six to 12 months, depending on the center. And then gives us time to evaluate for anybody being a liver, living donor. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> if there were any hands. Yep. One of the biggest uh, struggles that I see are the diabetic kidney disease patients who struggle with chronically low magnesium. Yeah. And trying to manage their fluid status and keep their magnesium above one. Yeah. Uh, you got any pearls on that? Um, if there's, well, amylaride is a great medicine because you're, um, it's, it's an MRA, you're decreasing proteinuria, you're working a little bit on that diuretic effect. And one of the side effects is actually uh, increasing is hypermagnesemia. So I actually use amylaride all the time in those specific patients. Yeah. Dr. Calabrese. Got to push the button. Yeah. <laughs> I was so, when I saw you walk in, Can't I was like, oh Push no. the button on your microphone <laughs> and just hold it down while you talk. 
So uh, GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists? Yes. You know if there's any studies done on non-diabetics? Not to, I think there's things in the works. I don't remember the name of the trials, but like as far as it being published, um, no. Not to, and I, I, I try to do my best to like double check myself before I present it. Not, not to my knowledge right now. One more point. The only, really it's Farsig is the only medicine that we can use of those diabetic meds um, that's been FDA approved in uh, non-diabetic uh, CKD. When you were talking about blood pressure control, I think you made a mistake. Oh, sure, sorry. Calcium yeah. channel blockers are the ones that lead to more heart failure, not ACE inhibitors. Um, if you, if I go back, you are right, but they still have some uh, increase. So they do increase still the risk of hospitalized and fatal heart failure. But are you talking about like incidents? No, oh. no. On the slide, even it, it was correct. It said that there was, uh, it was calcium channel blockers lead to more heart failure. And so just to make sure everybody knows, I mean, I see it all yes. the time and it's not just yeah. edema, it's yeah. true heart failure. Yeah. Uh, cardiomyopathy. Yeah. Whenever you're prescribing Farzig in the outpatient setting, question on, uh, from the uh, virtual audience is how much effort do you have to put into talking to our friends in uh, healthcare insurance uh, to get those approved for your non-diabetics? It's really not that hard at all. Um, I'll be honest, I kind of, my, um, I don't even know if I really should be saying this, but hey, if it's, it helps people, it helps people. Um, I say, hey, they have CKD. I cannot use metformin. It gets approved every time. Um, and so even though I'm not really using it in a patient that has diabetic CKD, insurance apparently is just like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know how legal that is to say that, but no, we've, and I've, for my IGA patient, that was a little bit trickier, but I wrote a letter for her saying, hey, this is why I'm doing it, and they approved it. Yeah, it used to be very hard. It's got, yeah. I've, I've been luckily successful. Any other questions? I'll just ask a quick question just from things that I hear just from residents all this time, uh, which is in-hospital diuresis of uh, those patients that are AKI. Yeah. For whatever reason, uh, there may be a little oliguric. Do you have a, like a consistent strategy that you choose to, to, to go after in terms of dosing frequency of your loops uh, whenever you're trying to get someone diuresis in the hospital? My biggest thing is looking at their, like the first thing I'm looking at is hemodynamics, um, even more than just like contraction alkalosis. Cause we've all seen those patients where they're drowning in fluid, but they're bicarb, you know, they could be a COPD or some other contributing factor where their bicarb's now going over 40, but I'm like, hey, I still have to diurese you. Um, and so I always teach my residents, hey, if you can improve hemodynamics, you can continue to diurese. So you take that heart failure patient and their blood pressure is too soft to diurese, hey, do we need to get think about an inotrope? Um, albumin and metadrin's my best friend. <laughs> But it really, I, for me, um, I haven't, and I don't know if Dr. Calabrese, if you agree with that too, I, I find if you are making sure that you have the kidneys perfused, you can diurese as much as you want. Well, unless, I mean, no, as, as needed. <laughs>